Hi, and welcome to another episode of Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'm Tom, and on today's show, I'm going to be talking to an artist who is in New Jersey. Her name is Jessie Taylor, and she's a painter. She's also a lawyer. She has a podcast that she does called Dream a Little Dream, and she started doing it to kind of talk about how people manage their their business, their painting, their creative outlet, and she can offer insight on it because she is you know, has a background as a lawyer. So it's kind of cool. We talk about that a little bit. We talk about how she gets inspiration from her paintings, how she works in larger scale paintings, and also how she's been kind of trying to adapt to, of course, the world where we can't go out and present our stuff in public. She's got some neat projects that she does. That's Jessie Taylor, and her website is jessietaylorpaints.com. And uh, her podcast is called Dream a Little Dream. You can check that out on all the places where you listen to podcasts. And of course, if you're listening to the show for the first time, go to my website, TomRay'sWebsite.com, and you can check out all of the other podcasts, subscribe to the show, check out my daily webcomic that I do, which is about my life, and also check out how I'm supporting myself by selling pop culture and vintage vintage items, not vintage, vintage items. So that's TomRay'sWebsite.com. Enough of all that. Here is the show with and my interview with Jesse Taylor. <laughs> and my website is jessietaylorpaints.com. I've been painting probably since I was about 16, so I guess coming up to like 20 something years and I just I love doing it and I've kind of elevated or escalated my um, my practice and trying to do more and um, working daily so that I can have a better a better skill set and a, a bigger um, uh, why can I think of the word now? <laughs> Body of work. Body there you of go. Work. Yeah. <laughs> Where are you located at? I'm in New York. I live in Slotesburg, New York. Slotesburg. And where's that? I Like I know yeah. anywhere in New York, but still, where's Slotesburg? <laughs> um, so right over the border of New Jersey. So like New Jersey butts up to New York, not, on, not where like Manhattan's kind of like an island, right? Mm -hmm. So like on the other side of the river but right where New Jersey butts up against New York. How long have you lived there for? About six years. Oh, really? Where were you originally? Missouri. I, I grew up, I was born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri. Oh, so you're a Midwestern person like me. Yeah. So when I saw, saw you were from Wisconsin, I was like, oh, okay, right on. <laughs> <laughs> what, what made you uh, move out there? It's a long story. <laughs> um, <laughs> I went to law school and- Really? Yeah, I went to law school in London, and so in order for me to stick no to the bar, yeah. All so right. when I got back from London, and I had finished law school, there were two states where I could sit for the bar exam, being foreign educated, and so I it, the choices were California or New York, and I have family in Jersey, so I was like, I'll just go to Jersey and you know crash with my aunt for a bit, and that's and I stayed. Wow. And so are you still doing law or is that something like, no, no. Okay. That's what I wanted yes, to know. Like, wait, now you're doing it, yeah. art. Okay. So uh, what they changed, they changed the laws for um, taking the bar exam. And if you're foreign educated, they won't allow you to take the bar exam unless you take an additional 60 hour course with the, with a, a college or university that's ABA accredited. So that's like another, like, I don't know, $150,000 in wow. full time. I was like, I don't know. Like the, the laws that are in the United States and the procedures that are here originated in London. So it's not like I'm coming from like some obscure third world country asking to sit for the bar exam, you know? So it was, it was pretty devastating. Yeah. And <laughs> this sounds like the plot to like a USA Network television show. Like, but you're secretly <laughs> going to practice law anyway because you're the best, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> I know. Well, I do kind of do like quasi law work. I, right now, um, I'm working with the company Business Licenses, where um, we do licenses for people, and we're handling the Sprint and T-Mobile merger, which is pretty giant. Oh wow! Yeah, I was actually gonna ask because I know um, I've seen that it says that you do like one of your descriptions on your Facebook page is that you 
do business licenses. And I was like, what does that entail? And is that yeah. something that can benefit you like as an artist as well? Like that means you must know like the financial and the legal side of, of like, uh, <laughs> putting degree, out yeah. Like if I, if you wanted to set up like a, a shop, like a gallery or something like that, I mean, you don't need many licenses for that. It's just, if you're doing regulated activity, like if you want to open a salon, for instance, or a tattoo studio or something, yeah. then you would have to come to us and I mean, you don't have to come to us. You could do your own research, but we would do the research and guide you through the entire process. So it's kind of like business coaching. Wow. Okay. That yeah. it, it does seem really handy because I know a lot of, uh, I mean, I don't know. I had to look into like how to even do LLCs and all that kind of stuff. And then you get overwhelmed with it. So you've got one step ahead, of course. Uh, clearly your knowledge is like beyond that. I'm just sitting here going like, ah, basic license knowledge uh, would right. be nice. And you're like intensely knowledgeable about <laughs> it. But, uh, yeah. and then why did you, uh, why did you end up making the transition to pursuing art? Well, that's what the whole thing was. So the plan was to go to law school, graduate law school, be a lawyer, make a bunch of money, and then retire being an artist, right? Right. So I love it. There you go. <laughs> really Done. Long, convoluted. You know, I was like, this is my plan. It's a it's a terrible plan. So my that's why I have a podcast now is to to say like if you should go with the thing that you're trying to do first. So uh -huh. don't try to like create this whole like circumvention like this manipulation. Just go for the thing and so that's that's what i'm doing but as you know i mean i don't know if you know it's it can be difficult to make money in the art world yeah so if you want to be able to live any kind of lifestyle that like you know eat regularly <laughs> like, <you> know, <laughs> it is it nice yeah <laughs> yeah yeah so having a salary job with you know health benefits and all that stuff and i have a child i'm, I'm a single parent i have a 15 year old so you know he's gonna become very expensive soon going to college so yeah, I, I lucked out. Mine decided he didn't want to go to college and I'm like, okay. I mean, I wish he would have, but at the same time, it's like, yeah, I mean, you know, you go forward. <laughs> well, then I'll give you a car or something. You want, you want something? <laughs> three cars. I gave him three cars. That's the other oh, thing okay. is they, they need to learn how to take care of them. You realize after a while, it's like, it's not your bedroom on wheels. Um, right. <laughs> True. And, so. Um, and, and I don't mean that in like the way that it could be taken. I mean that he never kept up his bedroom. That's what I'm saying. It's right. Like I picture like trash wrappers and like, you know, dead rodents under the chairs and stuff like that. Like yeah. that's what I picture. Yeah. <laughs> so when, when you, uh, you said you've been doing art for 16, since you were 16 or 16 years? Since I was 16. Yeah. So oh. what were some of your influences that got you started? Um, I don't know. I think that there was always like a present for me like when I was like a kid I always get like coloring books and crayons or like little paint sets and stuff like that and I always loved it and I always just played with it you know like that yeah. was like my thing and I mean I didn't start I feel like I say 16 because I really I took a painting class in high school and I took I started taking it serious like I was like oh I could really like express something you know mm -hmm. so it was one of those ones where you did it as an elective and then realized that you liked it yeah, yeah, where I was like, I can handle this. I mean, I had taken, my mom was even really supportive when I was a kid, too, and would put me in, like, little classes, like, at the Y or different little, you know, uh, institutions, and so I would have something to do on the weekends, but, um, yeah, so, but in high school, when everybody's, like, kind of competitive or whatever, I was like, I think, I think I could do this, you know? So. Yeah, and that competitiveness is actually kind of helpful sometimes. I had a conversation recently with someone on the podcast who, um, it was detrimental that he was the, to him, that he was the only one that was in the class because he was in a small town. So oh. be doing that, there was no competitiveness and, and it became something where it's like, that was, he didn't know what other people were doing or when he went out into the world, he was not prepared for the competitiveness because of that. Right. And it, it was, so that yeah. is, a, that is, who were some of the, uh, I was going to say, who are some of the people you competed with? But that's a silly question. That's, <laughs> but what, what was the medium in which you were, you were doing back? Did you start out with painting or did it just start as yeah. drawing? Okay. It did start with painting. Yeah. So like what kind of medium in painting, like watercolor? Um, no acrylics. And I mean, I tried oils, but oils are hard for beginning. That's you what know, I hear. It's easy, it's easy to muddy it. And so, um, I, yeah, when I figured out that acrylic dries a little bit quicker, I found that I, the layering was more that the style and the speed at which you can layer was more my style. So, yeah. And you said you uh, decided that you were going to take a little bit more seriously while you were in there. So in what ways did you start 
adjusting how you, how you pursued art and like how did it progress over the years like as you started doing it more and more like what ways were you pursuing it more seriously um i would just spend time kind of in alone in my room paint i mean i was in i was grounded a lot so i would oh. be in trouble <laughs> <laughs> that's helpful so, i guess you know taking it seriously also i also as a side note, realize how kind of therapeutic it was. Like it was just a way to, to like rehash out what was going on with yourself internally. Yeah. So, you know, even, and then I would get into, so I'd be in trouble, I'd be grounded and then I would paint in my room and then I would get in trouble for getting paint all over everything. <laughs> and so it just fueled, I'm, I'm like a rebel at heart. So it just fueled it more like that. So I guess that's the, you know, the seriousness is like, it's kind of like I like to be on the edge of making a mess, but also being like, you know, making something uh -huh. cool to look at. So. And you ended up going to school for law, though. How come you didn't go to school for art? Or did you go because to school for art? <laughs> I didn't. I took a minor. I took a minor in my undergrad, but um, I didn't think you could make any money at art. I didn't. I wasn't going to tell my parents like, hey, I'm going to be an artist. I felt like we were like a, just a working class family in Missouri, you know, like they're not going to be like, yeah, sure. I'll pay for your college so you can be an artist. Like that was yeah. not even a possibility, you know, I mean, or at least I didn't think it was. So. Yeah. It, Cause that is the funny thing. Like growing up, my parents always told me to pursue it and they're like, Oh, you're going to go on to be an animator and do all this stuff. But you never have the conversation of like, one, how does that happen? Or two, like, how do you make a living at it? And three, do you do it your own way? Do you find people to go pay you to do it? Or how are you? Yeah, none of those questions come up when you're in high school trying to pursue it. The parents are always just like, we encourage the creativity, which yeah, I, I assume right. they did, aside from grounding you for making a mess while you did it. <laughs> Yeah, like so for the most part, and except for when I was creative with like you know talking, they didn't like that. But like, <laughs> <laughs> I get what you're saying. <laughs> they um, they they were supportive, but they were always like you know like this is you know I don't know. It, I always got the feeling that that wasn't really a job, you know. Uh -huh. So, and that's why I started the podcast because I think that people do find they can make a job out of it and that's what, exactly what you said is like there's not enough discussion about it like how do you if you're an artist how do you go about putting together the pieces to like actually support yourself you and know that's there's, actually a good question i want to ask you that right back how do you go about doing that as an artist for me my story is is that i have a full-time job uh -huh. and then i do art you know some people actually can and but there's certain opportunities that I have where like somebody might commission a piece or so, there might be, a, um, there's like certain things that go around like in New York city or in, in the area over here. Like for instance, during Halloween, we used to do pumpkin painting and we get paid, you know, up to $150 per pumpkin that we painted these huge pumpkins. Right. And so like just making money in that way, but it's nothing that would support me for the whole year, you right. know? So, well, and you could paint pumpkins all year, but it, people just wouldn't but want them. them. <laughs> yeah, right. So, like, it's just, it's it's the continuum. It's like that threshold of, like, I couldn't, spending 40 hours doing art every week, I wouldn't have the time, you know, and then I'd have to give up the job. So, it's like, you're kind of in the middle of a, a catch-22 situation. At least I feel that way for myself. Yeah. And when you were saying painting pumpkins, you said, uh, we paint the pumpkins is there do you work with a group of people or yeah it's a it's like a, a show it's called the rise of the jack-o-lanterns that is in like three or four different locations in new york and jersey and then they also they're in chicago as well at the botanic garden oh. and um they yeah we and then we carve them out not we don't ever cut through the skin but it, it creates this really cool graphic if you do you know ink layers different um grades and then you know the top layer is carving and then shining the light through it gives it almost like a holographic look yeah you do like the <laughs> the sculpture like using the peeler or something to kind of sculpt into this to the rind or whatever yeah yep how did you get hooked up with that i found it on craigslist oh there you go yeah no i used to, yeah i used to like hustle around i used to like uh do paint nights at different bars and libraries and stuff like that but like at the end of the day i was only kind of picking up like a couple extra hundred dollars every so you know every week every other week or something like that nothing nothing that was like 
paying my rent in New York, you yeah. know. So. You did the paint nights. Were you running those or you found places, yeah. people that were, you were running them. So how would you, how would you advertise doing stuff like that? Like setting up an event, it's, it's easy to set up an event to get people to come to event. An event is what's oh. difficult. Well, I mean, now it's not because nobody can go to events, but when yeah, you were right. setting up events, like how would you get people to show up? What were some of the methods you, methods you used? Um, I, well, first off, I went to the libraries, so oh. that was easier because they already had a demographic. So I was like, Hey, I mean, I, and I knew that they worked quarterly. So I'd be like, let's do a fall paint night. Are you interested? And they're like, yeah. And then they pay you a flat rate and the patrons don't have to pay. You know, oh. a lot of times like you have these free evenings. So then I don't, I'm not, I'm not in the boat. I don't have to do anything to facilitate who's coming. I just have the painting and the supplies. It's probably so. like it's because they have a grant where they have to fulfill different types of activities for people to do. Yep. So they like they have to have programming. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. Well, that's fun. What kind of other stu stuff did you do? This is fascinating. You've done pumpkin carving and now you're doing paint nights. Like what other things yeah. have you done? Um, so at, there's a, I wouldn't necessarily get paid, but a lot of times some of these outdoor like rave like parties, I guess what we would call raves, people are, right, I don't know how old you are, but like, you know, <laughs> people born in, they partied in the nineties. Right. Right. We call them raves and they'd have like live painters. So they'd say, Hey, come out. You know, they don't pay you anything or maybe they pay you like 20 bucks or something. But sometimes at the parties, people would buy the painting right off the easel from you while you're out there live painting. Oh, wow. So, cool. Yeah. So I, would, I got in, I got hooked up with a couple of those things and, you know, sold a couple of paintings at a good time, you know, hung out with people playing, you know, DJs and stuff like that. So those were fun. It just was it's just like I say, you know, like I never found those situations where you're getting paid like a lot of money that's going to like really carry you through the next month, you know, so. Yeah. And when you did these things, would you just kind of wing it and like paint whatever or would you come with a plan for what to paint? Because painting live is it's like people are watching you and that's kind of yeah. something to get over in the first place too. Like let alone you're you're taking the initiative and going out to these events. But yeah, for people doing that, it's also scary to have people looking over your shoulder while you're doing these things. So what, what was your game plan usually when you would go out there? Just whatever or what? Sometimes. Um, I just try to like be part of the, the vibe, you know, like I just try to like kind of, you know, I have a splashy style. I don't, I never really start a painting out with like what I'm going to paint, like the, a thing, you know, yeah. I'm just like, I'm kind of moving stuff around and then, you know, eventually something will come out and I'll just run with it. And sometimes it turns out stupid. <laughs> you know? like, yeah. That's why you, you bring you bring a couple of canvases and you're like, oh, yeah, oops, and then slip it away, turn, you start a new one. But people are always interested in that white canvas and then all those first marks. They're like, oh, yeah, wow. And, you know, I don't know if they're like on drugs or whatever. Like, you know, <laughs> At the raves, they zero. may be. <laughs> I felt like they were very like, everybody liked it. Nobody was like. That's stupid. There's some disrespectful people that will, you know, oh, yeah. they, but like for the most part, I think everybody kind of, they, they like it and it, it adds to the vibe. Cause it's like, then they're like, that's really cool what you're doing. It's really fun to watch you. And I'm like, yeah, thanks. It's really fun to do it. So then it's like, you know, just kind of back and forth. So. Huh. And you said before too, that you had uh, been doing, that you had gotten commission work and stuff. How do you go about finding commission work or do just people find you or, I mean, oh, getting yeah. commission work is a big thing that people always tell me. And I, I'm always curious how they find it. Yeah, I don't do a lot of them. It would oh. just be like something small. Like, you know, if I was, oh, street fairs. I used to do a lot of street fairs, setting up street fairs. And people would be like, can you paint my dog? You know, or like something yeah. just, you know, little things like that. But I don't, I don't really like necessarily market myself as a, you know, a commissioning paint. Like I'm not, I'm not there yet, you know? Okay. So and I feel like it would take over a certain amount of my time too. And my style is... It's not really for everyone. You know, I think people who commission paintings kind of want something more realistic looking. Yeah. You know? So, but for the most part, you know, but my friends will commission me, my parents, my, my brother, my stepsister, you know, commissioned me a painting. So like I had that. And then the, one of the last things that I did is I started tattooing. So I was like, okay, I'm not making any, like a whole lot of money, but people do, do make a living off of tattooing. Uh -huh. So I took an apprenticeship and tattooed for almost three years. 
but I also kept my job, so I only tattooed like part time. And you can make decent money tattooing. Yeah. So that's one. It just doesn't. You don't usually get health care or anything like that. And you sometimes have to, you know, you have to share your commissions with the shop and rent your booth and everything like that. So, but it it is at least it's like a, um, you know, you're. There's a certain number of tattoos that you can do and you can charge X amount, you know, so right. it's not guaranteed, but at least when you do get a tattoo, you're going to get paid for it. So, and how did you get that idea? I mean, that's, I, I get the concept of like, yes, it is something that you would get paid for doing artwork, but like, that's, that's one of those jumps where it's like, I, it doesn't necessarily come right off the top of your head. Like, how did you go? Like, I'm going to go into tattooing. Is it something that you admired for a while? Do you have tattoos? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. A lot of tattoos. And, um, yeah, so I just figured it was pretty easy. <laughs> I don't know. Like, besides the fact that it has to be perfect, you know. Right, that's what I'm it's saying. Very- it's terrifying to me. <laughs> like, I would I would be – you can't throw away a canvas and get a new one when you're doing that one. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And when you're starting out, they always give you these pieces that are, like, totally unforgiving. Like, as – you know, when people start doing sleeves and, like, these big tattoos, yeah. there's so many pieces you can make a mess and like, you know, kind of screw it up and cover it up. But like, if you're like, I want an infinity sign. Yeah. Like if you accidentally veer off on that, it's like, it's over. Everybody knows you messed it up, you know? And and you did it for three years. Yeah. How long does an apprenticeship take? Yeah. So that was probably about a year of it. Okay. Was the apprenticeship. And so at that point I, I got probably the most of my hours on like Friday the 13th. We used to run these special. $13 $13 tattoos and all they would just be like, okay, all the real tattoo artists go home and the apprentices will do the $13 tattoos. And no so, way. <laughs> yeah. so we would be tattooing till like three o'clock in the morning. Cause everybody comes out for $13 tattoos and they'll line up down the street. And so I got a lot of, a lot of practice in on that. That's nuts. I, I, <laughs> I don't know how to react to that. <laughs> That's so interesting. <laughs> and at the same time, like so odd, Oh my God. That's hilarious. What would you say? What would you say your, uh, you were talking about the painting before and people necessarily didn't, you know, weren't into the style you did. They liked more realistic. What would you say your style is? Um, it's pretty, well, I don't know. Let me see if I can find a, a sample that I'm working on. I don't know how well, and it's, it's getting realistic. I mean, that's an anatomical heart, but like, this is pretty tight for me. Otherwise, I would be a little bit more splashy. You know, I don't. This is a painting that I'm doing for my brother commissioned me for his daughter that okay. was just born. I don't know if you can see it, but yeah, it's like ah, the phone is like backwards. Yeah, it's like <laughs> streaky with some graphic, you know. So, okay. so Dude. it's not something that somebody immediately is like, is like, oh, you would do such a great rendition of my grandmother. Right. You know, like, it's just it's not right. like the first thing in your mind. Yeah. So who are some of your influences when it comes to making art? I don't know. Um, I really loved like when I was in college, I really loved Salvador Dali mm-hmm. and Picasso. Um, and then because I'm from Missouri, I feel like we were always around a lot of Max Beckman. So then I got really into like the German expressionist side of things. Yeah. And so I guess those are my main, the main things that uh, have kind of influenced how I see shapes and color. And Do you normally work in a large scale like that? The paintings that you showed yeah. me, they were much larger. Cause I also saw on your Facebook page uh, that you traveled recently and you were doing watercolor on like a mini canvas book or pad that somebody oh, gave yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. My friend Mary Beth gave me these, this like little, like this big, yeah, little sketchbook, and I was like, "Girl, you don't you see how big I work?" <laughs> and she's like, "Just try it; it'll be fun." <laughs> right. So I did, and it was like, it was. It's kind of, it's kind of a different pace. It's fun. To yeah. Work. What type of stuff are you planning on doing? Like, how have you adjusted to not being able to go to the fairs recently? Like, what, what are some of the things that you've had to find inspiration? for or how how have you kept inspiration since there are no places to do public painting or to sell artwork outdoors or interact with people yeah well i feel like um so i really started to focus in on 
my podcast and reaching out to people and talking about the pandemic. It was helping that helped me. So I, I did, I used the pandemic as kind of inspiration with just, just making connection with people, you know, because you, you feel so isolated that it's like, I, you know, I, I don't know. Um, but I felt like it was a gift that I had time because mm -hmm. I, I, my calendar, if, you know, left to my own devices, I would literally fill my calendar up to the point that I have no time to paint, you know, like I'll, I'd be tattooing, doing pumpkins, you know, like, it's just like, there's, I'm never working on my own projects. And so I felt like it was like a sign. It was like, okay, it's time to start working on these projects that are staring at you in your house, you yeah. know? So I really took that advantage of that. And I made, a, so that painting that I showed you, the green one, I started a seven part series where I'm doing a painting for each of the chakras. So like that, those colors, you know, the colors of the rainbow and um, just focusing on each color and each energy center and a little bit of like symbolism and stuff like that going on. And so. you, you started a series meaning just that you're going to, I mean, is it something that you're putting out or are you, are you filming it? Like, how are you, how are you making this series? I want to be able to be shown in a gallery. Like okay. I, I want to have a body of work that I can pitch to a gallery and say, Hey, look, um, this would be a good show. It has a theme, you know, why don't you put it up sometime? And okay. see if they can pay me, you know? So, yeah. And you also said that you were making connections through the podcast. How are you going about that? Like, are you reaching out to people or are you just, yeah. Okay. Cause I've, I know that I've listened to some of it and I wasn't sure if you, um, I mean, li I've listened to the, uh, the most couple recent ones. And... Oh, that was just me. Yeah. Right. That's what I was asking. Cause I was like, <laughs> do, do you reach out to people? I didn't get to delve into it as much. So how do you reach out to people when you're, when you're looking for artists to talk to, or is it only artists that you talk to on the show? I talk to everybody. I, I get a lot of writers. I had a, um, a person who was a baker. I've been trying to get a female comedian. That's oh. those those are hard to keep, you know, I have a couple of bites, but the, the follow through is hard. So yeah, no, that's what, um, and I've kind of burnt out on the podcast. Cause I feel like you ask for every like 10, seven to 10 people you ask, you might get like three people mm -hmm. reply. Right. Yeah. And so, and then I use almost every single podcast. I always feel like we get good material, it, but it's just a lot of work, the editing. Yeah. You know, because we don't want it to sound we don't do I don't do it live and you don't want to sound like there's parts where I'm like, oh, my God, I forgot the question that I'm even asking you. Like, uh -huh. you know? <laughs> so, um, but a lot of times I find people on Instagram that I follow, like there's certain artists that I'm like, I love their work and I'll just take a stab in the dark oh, yeah. and see if they'll talk to me. And they say yes. And so I'm like stoked, you know? Yeah. No, I love email. People aren't aware, I don't think, of all the people that I email that I don't tell anyone about. Like, there are yeah. so many artists where I'm just like, I'm going to email and see if they reply. Sometimes they have, and sometimes you just, I never expect to hear back. You know, right. I've even had ones yeah. where I'm like, oh, it was so close. Like, we almost had something set up, and then they were like, oh, I can't do it. And then you try to reschedule, and then it's like no more co communication. You don't hear from yeah. them ever again, which that's fine. You know, I was, I was kind of yeah. psyched just to get that email to begin with. What kind yeah. of opportunities have you, uh, you know, gotten into, or have you been able to get by reaching out to these people? Like meeting people <laughs> is also networking is a big thing that I've learned. Oh, and, and the in-person thing. Yeah. It's easy. Sometimes it is easier in person, like at a live paint thing, you know, I could be like, Someone else, you know, some other painter will come up to me and be like, wow, I never thought about doing painting live. I'm like, oh, you're a painter. You have a card, you know, so like I'm always like, you know, my head's on a pivot. Like I'm like podcast, you know, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. but, um, uh, but I reached out to I was watching a TV show on Netflix and it was a design, an interior design competition last year. And there was a woman who went to law school, but decided that she didn't want to pursue law anymore and she wanted to be a designer and so she went on this show that sounds familiar and, <laughs> yeah i know so i was like oh my god i'm totally reaching out to her and i was like she's never ever gonna reply to me yeah. and she's like sure i'll do it and oh. i was like what <laughs> so like, I'm like somebody who's on tv yeah is gonna be on my podcast so like that was really fun when was and that I, that was last it was around last christmas like last um december probably second week of december yeah and now you guys vacation in the Hamptons together and your best friends. <laughs> no, but I follow her on Facebook and I like, you know, I, I play 
a part of her audience. I don't know if she plays as much about as part of my audience, you know, right. but like, yeah. So. Well, that's really that's cool. I, I think that's, I mean, those, that's the type of thing that uh, just reaching out to people can achieve. I mean, even just getting to meet someone, I mean, it's cool just to, if you went to a live event or like say saw a musician perform live that you really love, even if they stopped and said hello to you, that's awesome. You know? And so yeah. actually getting to sit down and talk with someone, you know, that's, that's fantastic. You got to do that. Yeah, no. And I've even, there's like some uh, painters on Instagram that I'm like, they're so awesome. And they're going to look at my Instagram. Cause I'll message them straight on Instagram and I'm like, they're going to never say yes. And sometimes I'm, I will be persistent until they answer, you know, and then they're like, okay, let's do it. And I'm like, Yay! Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like I, I love having painters the most because then we like really nerd out on paint and talking about it and stuff like that. So, yeah. It, yeah. Like what, what kind of, how do you nerd out on it? I'm curious. Like what, what do painters talk about? I, I guess I wouldn't have any idea. Cause I, I gave up on painting. I realized I was no good at it years ago. So what, what would okay. be some of the things you'd nerd out on? Um, well, one of the guys that I had on, and I'm drawing a blank on his name. I don't, I have memory issue lately. I think the pandemic is really like, kind of like time and space is weird. Right. Um, but he does a lot of really surreal kind of stuff. And so we just got into, um, discussion about how he gets his ideas. And I just felt like we were very similar in that way is like, you know, you're not trying to like you're not trying to latch on to like a trope or like a typical thing that people say or think, but mm -hmm. you're, you're trying to kind of put together two things that will bring out something different. You know what I mean? Like, so he had a painting where it was like a, a human like figure had its finger. It was like, it was laying on the ground and then there was like a cutout in the ground of another like figure shape. And mm -hmm. the person had his finger in it and it looked like, he was sad that he's like missing somebody, you know? And I was just like, what a wonderful way to kind of like express that, you know, like something's missing, you know, mm -hmm. like the passing of somebody. And so just like little, little things like that, like how, how you kind of conceive of the subject matter of your painting. And then sometimes we talk about process, like, you know, when you're, you know, you're so scared to put your paintbrush on the painting. Cause it's, almost perfect and you're like you know freaking out and, and you're like in the room by yourself and you're just like having a panic attack like as if you're on stage or something you know right so like just like stuff like that that we talk about yeah and what about the whole you say uh afraid to put the brush on the canvas but there's even a phrase that i use a lot too for myself personally which is sometimes you got to take the brush out of your hand and like you, oh. how, how do you know when you're done you know? I don't, yeah, that's the thing. You got to know when to walk away. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not, not to quote Kenny Rogers. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> I didn't even know that was Kenny Rogers, but that's what I say. I'm it's like, the gambler. Yeah. I don't know when to walk away. Yeah. yeah. Um, and have you ever collaborated with anybody before? No, no, not really like on purpose. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and I think of that just because you were talking about the similarities that you had with the person you were talking to. And I know someone else I had on the show um, is he really got into meeting other artists and trying to see what work they could do together. And oddly enough, it's oh, kind of skyrocketed him into doing murals and he's been doing oh, a lot nice. of those lately and murals have become very collaborative with people. Yeah. So I don't know. And you working with big scale, have you ever done murals before? Yeah. No, and actually I did, I went and um, helped a muralist that I had had on the podcast previously and she was in oh. New York and I was like, Hey, I want to stop by and like actually meet you in person, you know? Yeah. And uh, she's like, come on down. And I was like, can I help you on your mural? Like, I don't want to be there just like staring at you. I want to be useful. And she's like, yeah, definitely. So she gave me, she's like, just paint black in all of those spots. <laughs> so I spent oh, a few hours nice. helping her. Yeah. It's like you were the anchor. Uh, it, like yeah, in comic exactly. books that's funny yeah, what was yeah. the what was the mural of she did um it was in a uh, hummingbird she, hummingbirds are play a big part in her work oh, really? and like a picture of her grandmother her i think and her two daughters okay like very realistic painting um and they're they're like burning um sage or something like that and it, it's just like a, a throwback to like you know, the wisdom of the ancestors. So. Oh, wow. Where's it located at? 
It's in Kingston, New York. Oh, okay. All right. I'm sitting here trying to think of it. And again, I just said earlier, I have no idea where anything is, is in New York. <laughs> No, I know. Besides the city, right? Everybody knows where that is. Exactly. And I've only been <laughs> yeah. there once in my entire life, and it was at night. So, and it was just oh, passing through. Yeah. yeah, I, was, yeah. We pl I ended up playing a show there, and uh, then the next day we went to Philadelphia. So, to like some music mm -hmm. conference or something. Um, oh. And then as as a painter, and do it like with the, the series that you're doing, like what are some of the biggest challenges that you have putting together a series like that? Like what's you're, you're, I mean, you can say you're going to do a seven part series, but how do you go about doing that? And like, what are some of the difficulties of that? I guess the biggest struggle is just getting it done. Yeah. Cause I already have it all pretty much mapped out. I'm, you know, I just need to sit down and paint it. So that's why I kind of started the podcast talking about how I've been really incorporating a daily practice and I've been coming out to the studio every morning, like first thing and putting in at least 20, 30 minutes on every day so that at least I make some progress because seven paintings, yeah. you're not going to just be done. <laughs> you know? So that's the biggest struggle is just like dedicating the time to getting it completed. Yeah. How do you map out something like that? Well, what I, so without giving it all away, I guess. So I'm using, um, I love it. I'm, it's like, it's like it's an M night Shyamalan movie or something. You don't want to give away the twist. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, I decided I'm going to do crystals. So I'm going to paint, I want to paint like crystals or diamonds or something like that for each oh. of the color. So red, orange, yellow, green, blue. And then each of the chakras already has like a number of petals. So each chakra has like a lotus flower, right? Okay. And then it will have a number of petals. So instead I translated that into the number of points that a crystal would have. So like, you know, a diamond would be however many sides or, you know, there would be, um, you know, like uh, that one is the one I showed you has 14 points. Yeah. So it's like a star, you know, a 14 pointed star. So that's already kind of mapped out for me. Right. I just have to put the put the geograph the put the thing on the, the canvas. Mm -hmm. So and then I decided to incorporate also the designs that are on the dollar bill. So I chose which pieces of the dollar bill like filigree that I'm using for each of the chakras. So I just have to put it all together. Yeah. And you're into yeah. your one painting into it right now? No, five. Oh, you're five into it. Okay. I thought you just had the yeah. one that you showed me. So you have five. Yeah. Well, they're all at different stages. Okay. But, um, and two are. Oh, you're doing them not... like in tandem. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. I wanted to, yeah. So that they all at least have some, cause I don't, you know, over the course of seven paintings, if I just did one, you learn so much from one to the next yeah. that I wanted them to look together, you know? So. Right. And I suppose that way you don't get burnt out on one. And also it does seem more efficient now that I think of it. Like that's silly not to work on multiples at the same time, isn't it? It makes sense. Yeah. I don't know why I was thinking yeah. like you had to wait till you were done with one to move on to the other. Oh, okay. No, but I am trying to incorporate that into my, my, uh, the way I work because yeah. I used to have just all of my paintings are unfinished. I'd have 50 unfinished paintings. And so now I'm trying to be like, I'm going to finish at least one set of paintings before I move on to anything new. So that's motivation. And when you say unfinished, like, have you ever tried, and this is just me thinking off the top of my head, have you ever just shown them to people, even though they're unfinished? And I know to you, it's like just showing this horrible, unexposed, <laughs> you know, sort of thing. But like, do you think other people would interpret them as being unfinished? Like, I, I, I often wonder the, uh, the amount of work that I know people don't show the public. I'm curious yeah. if you've ever tried showing someone just to see what their reaction is. Yeah. Well, I mean, I used to do a bunch of street fairs and I love live painting. Like, so there, I'd spend a weekend at a street fair and I'd bring all of the paintings I'm working on okay. and I would go, you know, I'd spend, you know, one hour on one, put the, put it to the side, spend an hour on another one. And I've had people buy them right off me in those stages. What about the the unfinished ones that you were waiting to do? Like, would people buy, go sometimes. to buy? Okay. That's what, that's what I was wondering. Because sometimes yeah. I know we and say so it's unfinished, but other people are like, this is fantastic. You know, it's right. it's that, that goes back to the uh, afraid to put the brush on the canvas sort of thing. Like, maybe yeah. you are done. <laughs> right. No, and I definitely wouldn't let something go if I was like, that is not even done. Like not even like, you know, there, or but why I was not? Like, what, that's <laughs> what I'm saying. Why not? Like if somebody really appreciates it as is, you know, it's, yeah. it, 
I mean, why wouldn't you let go of it? And I'm, I'm legitimately asking you and me that because I'm thinking the same way. Like I have tons of unfinished stuff where I'm like, ah, I'll work on that some other day. And it's like, or maybe I can just show someone. So yeah, what, why, why do we think like that? <laughs> I don't know. Well, some of it is sentimental, right? Because you're like, I want to see it finished. So I'm not ready to sell it. Yeah. right? Because you want to like what you want to see what it's going to look like when it's done. But then there's some that are they're just varying stages of me spending time on them, you know, and I'm happy to I'm happy that somebody has seen what I've seen so far on it and that I'm happy to sell it, you know, so that's there's two sides of it. And there's a saying that says the painting's not done till it's sold. I guess I've never heard that saying, but I like it. Yeah. Maybe that's just an extension of my take the brush out of your hand. But no, because then it would never mind. I don't need to think about that out loud. <laughs> um and so have you been adjusting it all to the fact that a lot of stuff is moving online with your paintings at all? Um, I guess I do. So I did do some of those paint nights on Zoom, you know, with my friends and family. Okay. And, um, but it's, I mean, art galleries have always kind of been going out of style since the internet anyways. Yeah. It sucks because I feel like being... Being in person with a painting, especially a painting like one of mine, I think, it's so much better to see it in person. A, a picture just flattens it, you know? It yeah. just makes it so two-dimensional. And and also, like, I love selling my paintings to people because – Like in I love person, talking. you mean? Yeah. I like talking to them in person. We're connecting, and I'm like, I'm so happy that this painting brought us together, and we have so much to talk about because of it, you know, like yeah. that's like the best part of the whole process. But I mean, of course, besides like it come the painting coming together perfectly, but like you know, right. the connection with other people, you know, so. And then what do you have coming up like uh, on the podcast or painting aside from uh, the series that you're working on? Like what are some of the plans that you have in the future coming up? If any, I want to get, I want to get a residency somewhere um, like a, oh. a yeah, where I where I would be stationed somewhere and paint, you know, on site at, at a, a place that has some sort of prestige, I guess. And I want to get a gallery show. So I'm working on my body of work so I can get that together. And the podcast has kind of taken a back seat a little bit lately. I used to put one out every single week. Mm -hmm. But like I said, it just got to be so much. And I feel like if I'm so I'm making the podcast to promote myself as mm -hmm. an artist, but I'm spending all my time making the podcast. And then, you know, like one, let's say one day somebody discovers me through my podcast and I have no paintings, <laughs> then that's just going to seem stupid. So <laughs> you know, like I have to get some paintings done. Right. So. Well, and isn't that part of the game plan that you have of the, uh, at least working 30 minutes a day on, on doing yeah. some of the painting? How has that been yeah. going by the way? I mean, are, are you finding success in that? Or are you sticking to it? Yeah, for the most part, I do. I I used to have some sort of aversion to painting in the morning. I don't know why, huh. like, but it's actually better. And I feel like, thank God I got that out of the way. You know, like now right. I don't have to worry about like not doing it after work or, you know, being too tired or whatever. So. And if yeah. people wanted to check out some of the stuff that you do, where are some places online that they could that they could see your work. Yeah, they can check me out at jessietaylorpaints.com on the World Wide Web. And <laughs> I also have Jesse Taylor Paints on Instagram and jessietaylorpaints.com on Facebook. And I can be messaged, you know, I can be contacted through either of those sites. I have a podcast as well called Dream a Little Dream, which is on all of the platforms, I believe, like iTunes, Google Play. I, I haven't put it on YouTube or anything yet, but um, SoundCloud and Stitcher as well as Spotify. So that's me. Great. And I want to thank you so much for signing up to be on the show and I'm getting yeah, the chance to meet you. It's, I love this. Thank you.